Text for our admonition today. First Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 11, and Jude, verses 3 and 5. But as we prepare to go into this text and apply it to the situation of our church and the world today, I pay very great respect to our Father, the primate of all Nigeria. His Grace, the Most Reverend Dr. Henry Chukudum Undukuba, Doctor of Divinity, and Mama Nigeria, Mama Angela, thank you for playing host to our fathers who have come all over Africa. And thank you so much for making yourselves the Tertullian, the Iranians, and the Augustine of our time. Africa indeed has come of age. That was the theme of the Kappa Conference in Lagos in 2004. Africa has come of age. We are no longer underdog to anyone. We are not an inferior race. We are not inferior people. We don't have inferior gospel. Only Christ can tell us what to do. And the Bible is the only constitution we know. And heaven and earth may move up and down. The word of God remains standing. I want to thank you, your grace, for asking me to bring the word to our fathers here. I, I am highly honored that this has come to me. And I pray as I welcome our fathers God Almighty, we use this, our gathering, to turn things around for good in Jesus' name. This gathering reminds me of an event that happened in 1845. I was in Berlin. I saw the place where the Berlin Conference took place. Africa was not involved. Africa was not even invited as a participant. But the leaders of England, France, Belgium, Portuguese, all of them gathered around, and they took the map of Africa and started to share us at like a piece of cake. Britain says, give me Nigeria, give me Ghana, at Syria alone. And then the France say, give me Togo, give me the, and that was, we were not there. But the impact of that decision was the beginning of colonization, and we are here to recover from it today. It's not about how many we are. You represent, my dear fathers, your graces of Kappa, our prime is you represent millions of Anglicans, Christians, who today are in the global south and have 80% of the Anglican population. We are the Anglican communion. We are not living the Anglican communion. We are the Anglican communion. And your gathering here is supposed to boost your faith, our faith. And we take this back to everyone all over that destiny has put in the hands of the African primates the responsibility to defend the faith. How interesting that history repeats itself. We've played this role in the past. This is not the first time that Africa will be facing controversies. We've had the Donatist controversy. We had the Aryan controversy. We had the Marshallite controversy. We had the Montanist controversy. These were the reasons why leaders like Athanasius, Tertullian, Irenaeus, St. Augustine, all Africans stood as the vanguard of theology and mission. So our admonition today is coming to us that in the situation where there is turbulence everywhere in the world, God has brought you up here in the retreat program for us to rub minds together. Thank you for what you have done for the work of God. 
thank you for your leadership position in GAFCON. And when you see what is happening in the Anglican Church today, you should not be surprised. Because even the Church of England and the Archbishop of Canterbury, whom GAFCON meeting at Kigali said we have no more confidence in, and we are trying to reset the Anglican communion, they are on disguise in what they are doing. There is an agenda against God, against the Bible, and they are going ahead in defiance of exactly what the Bible has already said. But I'm not surprised. The role of the church leadership today is the same role that was played by the Jewish leaders in those days. The Sadducees were the leaders of Judaism at that time. They produced the high priests. But who are those that killed Jesus? They were the Sadducees who spearheaded it. So church leadership have often been killing the truth of the gospel. That is the role that God has put in your hands today. Our fathers and our mothers who are here gathered, securing simply means we have something good and we are losing it. We need to secure it. We want to keep what we still have. And that is the foundation. There is no other foundation anybody can lay. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, the same today, the same forever. The gospel does not change. Gospel can never be subservient to the culture. Where gospel and culture meet, the culture has to buy, bow, and the gospel has to prevail. So securing our theological and mission foundation simply means that we should look at those theologies, our knowledge about God, our studies about God, our studies about Christ, that have sustained Christianity up to this particular moment. And what are the mission commitments that we have? That is the objective of our discussion here today, for us to develop the foundation. If the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If you look at the gospel read to us today, Jesus was very clear, he is the way. He has sheep that he wants to bring into the pasture. And when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter, four, chapter 3, and you look at verses 9, 10, and 11, he said, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. We have a foundation laid by the Lord Jesus. We had a background in the Old Testament. We had a background in the ministry of Jesus. We had a background in the ministry of the apostles. We had a background in the ministry of the martyrs who died for Christ. We had a background in the ministry of the apologists who defended the faith. We had a background also in the reformers, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Hus, every one of them. We have a background of the reformation theology. We have a background of missionaries that brought Christians into Africa. We have a background of truth. We have a background that produces us here. Somebody lives, another builds upon it. William Shakespeare says the world is a stage. All of us are master builders. We play our role, and we quit the stage. Destiny has put in our hands today the responsibility for the church. And this church is not just, oh, it's just Anglican church. That's one thing that the Anglican church has to be mindful of. We are just one out of thousands of other denominations. He is the God of the Roman Catholic. He is the God of the Baptists, of the Methodists, of the Pentecostals and the Amelios. This Bible is the common denominator. This gospel is the same gospel. And Paul wants us, even if an angel comes to preach any other gospel different from this, let him be anathema. So our foundation is the word of God. And we have the basics of our theology. We have the basics of our mission. We are sent to all nations of the world. This is talking about foundation. What are we building on it? Are we building upon gold, upon silver, or straw, or things that are perishable? So we should not be disappointed about behavior and misbehavior by church leaders. They are human beings. At the point in the time, in the time of Noah, God said he regretted that he even made man. In anger, he destroyed the whole of humanity and raised a new race. So we are not facing something new. We are doing something that has been done before. We are not reinventing the way. And our challenge here is, as we ruminate on the situation we are facing in our church today, we know that God, who is the God who started the church, he will build his church and the gate of hell shall not prevail against it. We also want to consider the admonition of Jude. He was very undisguised when he was giving the admonition. He said he earnestly beseeches us to contend for the faith, which was once and for all delivered unto the saints. For people have crept in into the church. They've taken ordination. They've risen through the ranks. They're not primates. They're not bishops. They're not archbishops. They're not there. And now they're in charge of authority, running church, not running the church of Christ. He said we should be very careful because they have come in and they are trying to bring in heresies. They are trying to turn the gospel of Christ upside down and challenge 
dignitaries challenge even the foundations. We are dealing with problems of revisionism. We are dealing with rebellion and the losses of churches everywhere. Everywhere in the West, we are in trouble today. They are selling off churches. Churches are persecuting those who are faithful, selling off churches to Muslims. And Islam is taking an ascendancy. They are taking over Muslim territory. They are taking over France. They are taking over the United Kingdom. And our, our leaders are not bothered about the loss of Christianity. They are no longer Christians. Because if you violate the Bible, you violate your Lord Jesus Christ, you are no longer Christians. Your being Christian is on account of your believing God. You are being born again, accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. Committing yourself to the finished work of Christ on the cross. And now committing ourselves to the commission for worldwide evangelization as Christ gave it in Matthew 28 verse 19. And living our lives, Christian lives, in strict compliance with the literal demands of Christian ethics. That is what makes us Christians. If our names are in the book of life, and we are disciples of Jesus Christ. So Jude wants us in Jude chapter 3, verse 3, that look, judgment is going to come. As God has judged the angels who left their estate, God threw them out. As God judged the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and rained down fire and sulfur and wiped them, and there are archaeological evidences to show that this is true, God is going to judge us. So how do we sustain our foundation? I want to remind us about our foundations. Foundations of biblical orthodoxy are in two ways. Theological foundations and mission foundation. Let's look at the theological foundation. It is belief in the Bible as the inspired word of God. Belief in the authority of the Holy Bible that it contains everything necessary for salvation and for the ordering of our lives. It talks about our eternity. It talks about spirituality. It talks about prophecy. Everything happening in the world today, they are there in the Bible. This is the only book. This is the constitution and nobody has the right, no matter who they are, white or Asian or African, to tamper with this. This is the constitution. Even in countries, you don't tamper with your constitution. There is a due process for doing that. But today, we are so irresponsible. We didn't start that way. We started our church life rest, having respect for the Holy Bible. It was Biblia Sacrae. And people bowed at the name of Jesus. People didn't tamper with the Bible today because of liberal theology. Seminaries are producing priests who don't know God. Who don't know God. Who don't believe in God, who don't believe in Jesus, who don't believe in the resurrection, who don't believe in holiness. And so to them, this is a book. This is not a book. This is the word of God. And it is applicable to all people all over the world. So our belief in the existence of God, our belief in the lordship of Jesus, our belief in the authority of the Holy Bible, our belief in the resurrection of Jesus after he died, our belief also to the Reformation theology that came and gave us the Protestant church movement away from the excesses of Roman Catholicism. It is on the basis of this we had a grounding. And when we had controversies by eggheads, intellectual radicals, who were championing the change of basic Christian doctrine, African leaders stood up and they now created our creed. Our creed formations are very clear. It talks about, I believe in this. Your belief in the Father, your belief in the Son, your belief in the Holy Spirit, your belief in the Church. We have the Apostles' Creed. We have the Nicene Creed. We have the Athanasian Creed. All this came from African people. Even the New Testament was canonized in Africa in 397 AD at Carthage. So Africa has contributed a lot to Christianity. Our background is to believe in the authority of the Bible, is to believe in sound gospel. Our sound gospel is John chapter 3, verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, go to hell, but also live and go to heaven in eternal life. Very simple. And so, God wants us against heresies. And the mission of the church, you cannot be more Christian than Jesus. Neither can you be more Catholic than the Pope. Jesus Christ came and repeated in Luke chapter 4, the Messianic agenda. Why did he come to be a Messiah? He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, to set the captives free, to declare the acceptable year of the Lord, to turn their ashes into beauty, to raise oaks of righteousness. We have Isaiah chapter we, we call it Messianic Manifesto. And also to change the situation in the society to rebuild the walls that have been destroyed by our forefathers. Africa needs this a lot. So the responsibility of the gospel is not just proclamation, it is also healing. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 7 and 8, he said, Look, when you go, preach the gospel, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, and raise the dead. 
He was ministering to the needs of the people. He fed the 5,000. He was delivering people of demons. He was the greatest deliverance minister. He raised the dead. He transformed society. The 12 people that he raised became many disciples. Look at us today. So many millions of people. So we thank God. Our God doesn't judge anything by numbers. It's about quality, not quantity. If 12 people turn the world upside down, we in Africa, by the grace of God, the Lord will use us to turn the world upside down. We are talking now about a reverse mission. Those who brought Christianity to us, they have clearly lost it. It's very clear. Godfrey Chaucer, who wrote the Canterbury Tales, says, if gold begin to rust, what will I do? If a house of bishops in the Church of England made a proposal for homosexuality to be recognized, and now they are moving forward to say, you cannot bless them in church, and a priest trained in a seminary, who has the Holy Bible, who knew what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, will come to say, we approve this, America approve it, Canada approve it. It's not, they are gentiles like us. We are Africans. We, 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 we developed this. On the day of Pentecost, Africa was there. African and African played an important role in the evolution of Christianity. We are not underdogs. This Bible is our Bible, and we are not going to compromise. So we have a good theological background in our respect for the Scripture, respect for the Lord Jesus, respect for the Holy Spirit, respect for the Worldwide Commission, respect for evangelization. Of course, attack will always come. The Jews attacked Jesus Christ. They attacked the apostles. We had emperors who came and they were clean Christians simply because they were Christians. They were thrown to the lions, but as you know, Christians who have been persecuted were told by Tertullian that the blood of the matter was the seed of the job. The more they persecute us, the more we are going to grow. Nobody can kill Christianity. It is unfortunate you can't find some Christianity in many places in the West and only in Asia and Africa. We should guard jealously what God has given us opportunity to do. And let us build upon the foundation of our African forefathers. I mentioned them earlier on. I mentioned Origen. I mentioned Tertullian, Irenaeus, Augustine, even St. Antony, the father of monasticism that made people to have convents and none. We are the parents of theology and the spirituality of the church. Let us not forget the foundation also of Martin Luther's reformation. Let's not forget the Calvinist Reformation where he now Christianized society to the extent that Western Europe was regarded as Christian society. Today, they don't call themselves Christian. They are now a post-Christian society. Many, many heresies are coming everywhere. And today, we are in confusion. Extreme prosperity theology is taking over from the theology of the cross. People want God for what they will get, not because they want to serve him. People have a wrong doctrine of permanent salvation. Once you are saved, you are saved forever. And many of our young ones are following a libertine theology. Once I'm born again, I can live my life in a very reckless way. Let us not forget that God delivered the children of Israel, millions of them, but he perished all of them. Only Caleb and Joshua go to the promised land. It's no respect of a person. Let's not forget about the miracles of Moses. A simple mistake, he didn't get to the promised land. So God does not judge anybody, no matter who they are. And so there is nothing like once saved, once you are saved forever. There's nothing like extreme prosperity theology. That's what they preach now. They preach Epicurean church worship. Let there be glamour. Let there be entertainment. You can dress anyhow. You can behave anywhere. You feel fine when you come to church. It doesn't happen that way. Charles Spurgeon preached in his church one day, and somebody came there and said, I was in church last week. Somebody else preached. I felt fine, and I was shouting hallelujah. But when I listened to Charles Spurgeon, I bowed my head in repentance, weeping. The message that makes people to repent, that is what we need today. We will not change from the old-time religion. People today are supporting same-sex marriage. People are, people are talking about liberal theology. They are allowing people to divorce at will. They are even debating and fighting over abortion has become an issue in American politics. Can you imagine that? Abortion, killing human beings, your own future generation. They are claiming right to kill millions of their people are dying and they are committing murder right from the womb. These issues that were, uh, were, cannot even be mentioned in those days. People are not ashamed of it. Even pastors are divorcing and remarrying. How did we get here? We were not raised in this way. In Africa, the missionaries gave us a sound theology. Parents gave us a sound background. Every morning, people gathered together. They rang the bell. The father would preach. The mother would lead prayer. The children would read, sing these hymns. And we were given a good grounding. Because the Bible says, teach your children the way to go. And when they grow up, they will not depart away from it. That was the background that we have. Today is so difficult. 
to now know who is the genuine Christian. There are fake, many fake people among us. People are not ready to endure persecution any longer. Materialism has taken over our priority. People are looking for wealth and material things. They don't want to be like Jesus. They don't want to be humble like Jesus. They don't want to be spartan like Jesus Christ. And people, we don't even know who is. Some are using strange power, even in the church of God, doing miracles instead of them to win souls. So many churches everywhere, the impact is so low. Somebody said one kilometer long, our Christianity, one inch very deep. That's the problem. They say we make a lot of noise. We must go back in Africa to let them understand that we are going to go back to the foundation of Christianity. Go back to the pattern of Jesus. Go back to the pattern of the apostles. Go back to doing miracles. Go back to preaching the way Jesus Christ preached. Go back to resisting heretics. Go back to challenging those who are using false power. You know Paul and enemies. He commanded blindness to fall upon him. Samuel Magus came with, 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 with against to Peter. He said, your silver perish with you. People were courageous. We must go back. In those days, Christians were watchmen over the society. That's what Ezekiel said. Oh, you son of man, I make you a watchman over society. When you see evil, you speak against him. But today, we don't speak against evil. The voices of the men of God are no longer loud, even as the society is in crisis, and we see political chaos, and you see moral depravity. You see where we are in Nigeria today? See where we are in Africa today? See the problem happening in Kenya today? See the problem in America today? America, God's own country, has those degenerated. They don't even have leaders anymore. See the two people who are contesting for their presidency. Is that the best America can give? When you rubbish your Christian foundation, you come out with zero and weak leaders. That is the problem we are dealing with today. We must go back to the family. We must go back to curing the pulpit of the gospels that we preach. We must tell people the truth and tell them about heaven and hell. Tell them it is appointed not to man wants to die. After that comes the judgment. We must fight against enemies of the Christian faith. Our enemies are so many. Islam is bent on destroying Christianity. They took over North Africa from us. They took over Asia Minor from us. They are taking over Britain. Many of the mayors in England and Britain today are Muslims. And they are not shooting any gun, but they are taking over. We are busy fighting each other, fighting over doctrine. And they are busy systematically taking over our children. And today they have respect for their scripture. You don't tamper with the Quran, they will kill you. You don't insult their prophet, they will kill you. But our theologians, irresponsible seminarians, we criticize Jesus, we criticize the Bible, and we tamper with the Bible. I was leasing a, a service during my ordination at Elisha Diocese. An advocate was asked to read the, 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 the Holy Gospel. He read a version that was questionable. I had to stop the service. Where did you get that from? He said, Bible. Bible? Terrible translations that are saying things different from the original. Go back to the original. Say it exactly the Bible says it. Go back to the word of God. Obey the word of God. Don't argue with God. The Ten Commandments are the Ten Commandments. The Beatitudes are the Beatitudes. The instructions are... Jesus was not disguised. He was clear. He wasn't tolerating any nonsense. He came to the temple and whipped those who were selling and buying in the temple. He looked at the Pharisees and said, you, say, you are blind guys. He called them the children of the devil. He was very clear. We must be clear against evil. Clear against misbehavior. Clear against corruption. Clear against sexual aberration. We don't have to go with the West. If they are rushing to hell, we don't have to go with them. We are now of age. Our primates of Kappa responsibility is on you. I don't care how many storms happen. Many disappointments will come, even from among us. Let us not be counted among those who are going to disappoint God. God has called us to work, and let us do the work. We will be individually accountable unto the Almighty God. So, if others are destroying their own churches, let us build our own churches. And if God helps us to do it right, we go back there to go and re-evangelize them. And that's the reason why we have some of our churches who are present over there. Because if you don't trust the gospel they are serving over there, you won't allow your own people to be misled. You have to take care of your sheep. Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not here. Our sheep everywhere, including United Kingdom. Now that the Church of England is going the way they are, they are not being disguised any longer. They have no shame. It is now time for you to go and begin to raise an alternative Akna in the United Kingdom, strengthen what you have there, and let even the whites who are discouraged today find hope in African genuine Christianity. We must go back to that. In conclusion, we are in battle. And this battle is going to be fought by the Lord Jesus himself. He is the one who owns the church. 
He has called us to come and do this work, and we are going to be accountable for all those people under our charge. As primates, your accountability is greater than mine. I'm only going to be accountable for the diocese and the diocese put under my charge. A pastor will be accountable for the congregation under his child. Everyone under your watch, you will account to the owner of the church. But you are accountable for a whole nation. That's the reason why you have to get it right. In dealing with the government, you have to get it right. You must be the voice of change in your society. Martin Luther King Jr. in America, he was a full-time Baptist clergyman. He said, no, racial segregation must stop. He took the Bible and he said, no, I have a dream. A day we come in America, there must be change. William Wilberforce went to the Parliament of England and said slavery is evil. 1807, they were able to now pass the abolition. We would not have been free but for the courage of people like this. Only one man, William Wilberforce, only one man, Martin Luther King Jr., see what we have today. Change is possible. Let's not look at what they are doing. Let's stand on the path of truth. Let's go back to the foundation that God has given to us. Let us encourage spiritual formation. Let's commit, it, commit ourselves to the gospel. Preach it the way they are and let people give their life. Let's warn them about hell. Let's encourage them to go to heaven. Let them set their affection on things above. Let us respect our book of common prayer. The Church of England does not respect the book of common prayer any longer. They have thrown it into the wastebasket. They have thrown away the fundamentals. They don't know anything about the Chicago Quaterateral. We have ordinal. We have everything. Everything in the Anglican church is Bible-based. We have a good tradition. Anglican orthodoxy must be maintained. Our catechism must be maintained. Our 39 articles must be maintained. Our theology is very sound. We will not allow anybody to take away what God has given to us. So, we must go and remember what God has asked us to do. He wants to save the whole world. That's why he called Abraham. That's why Jesus Christ said we should go to all nations of the earth. He said to Abraham, through you, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. That's our mission foundation. We have a commission to save those who are dying, to save those who are getting lost in their thousands and their millions. And let us not compromise the truth that Jesus is the only way. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. There is no other name given under heaven where anybody can be saved except the name of Jesus. We will not compromise that. Inclusive theology can never work. There is only one way to heaven, and that way is Jesus. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Let us bring back the missionary zeal. If they left Europe to come here to live and to show us the way, let us also go back and save others and save our own family, save our children. In many parts of Africa today, the nightclubs are taken over from the churches. Many of the young people are no longer in church, and we are comfortable as long as the system runs. We are not called to run system. We are not called to run establishment. We are called to save souls. He said, all my father gave me, I didn't lose. Except Judas, the son of perdition. If you have a hundred sheep and one of them is lost, leave the 99 and go go for the one. Let's go back to mission. I was at Singapore when we had the Global South in 2010. And the resolution, I was one of those that drafted the, the communique. Too much noise, fighting over this homosexual. We will fight them. We will respond to them. But then, let us face mission. Let us face mission. Let us face evangelism. Let us bring back miracles. Let us bring down the Bible. Let's put the preachers on the street. Let us cure our theological seminaries. Let us change the curriculum. Let us equip them with what will make them ministers of God. When you have a good theological education, you have good ministers, you have priests. But when you have a bad one, they are the ones that kill the church. Our problems are fundamental. Let's go back to the drawing table and try to see how we can bring back mission. Like the CMS and the USPG, let's begin to go all over the place. Let's bring back apologetics. We have brains in the Anglican church. We are one of the most highly educated denominations in the whole of the world. Many with PhD, many professors here and there, but little writings. The space on the internet, the space in literature are occupied by those who teach evil. You don't fight darkness by whipping darkness. You bring light, and when light comes, darkness goes. We are the light of the world. Let our lives shine intellectually, in passion, in evangelism, and then we can go back and strategize on how we can go back to our old ways. Our call today, as we gather, during this particular retreat, our day of primates and all eminent children of God is to go back to the foundation. Go back to the foundation. Our African proverb says, if you don't know where you are going, at least you know where you are coming from. We have a good foundation, let's bring it back again. And that will determine our future. I pray that God will give you the grace as you come to seek the face of the Lord and you begin to rub minds with your fellow brothers, may we take our position. It doesn't matter how many we are, we are strong enough to bring about change. One thing I know is truth and falsehood. There is a battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the devil. When there is truth, falsehood will bow. Where there is light, darkness will bow. 
I pray that being the light of the world, we will have the courage to take good leadership over GAFCOM, over GSFA, and that we will not, because of mammon, compromise our faith. We know how GAFCOM started. We know how some African provinces are going back because of aid from the West. It is an aberration. In the days of the missionaries in Nigeria and other parts of Africa, the secretary of the CMS then was Henry Venn, Reverend Henry Venn. He was the one that advocated that Africa should be self-governing, self-sustaining, and self-propagating. We don't need the West for anything. We are good enough to go. God will use us as he has used people in the past. I pray that God Almighty will inspire you. And when you go back home, the Lord will bring revival in all our churches. Those who have left will come back. Our young ones will come back. The Pentecostal power will be more manifest in our people and the foundation of Anglicanism, which other churches are copying, will be strengthened. Strengthen the Bible. Strengthen faith in Christ. Strengthen holiness. Strengthen evangelism. Go for mission and the Almighty God who is the owner of the church, he will save his church. Bow your heads and let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for the opportunity for our primates to play host to our fathers and primates of Kappa. Thank you for what you did with Africans in the past. Thank you for what you are doing and thank you for what you will do. The battle is not for Gafcon. The battle is not for primates. The battle is not for us. The battle is yours. And nobody confronts you and succeeds. You will win this battle. You will use us. You will bless us. And through us, Heavenly Father, your kingdom will be enlarged. And I pray that all of us who are working and who are serving you, we are at the end of our labor here on earth. Find the grace to enjoy heaven. Let us make it to the end. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Let us be conscious of the ephemeral nature of life. To understand that this world is not our home, that heaven is our goal, and that our goal is to bring people away from the wide way that goes to hell and bring them back to the narrow way. Help us to maintain the foundations of our theology and foundation of our mission. We come back on track, fight against those who are against Christ, and at the end of the day, we will reign with the Lord. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord.